So fortunately, despite all of our efforts, um, we haven't got the boater resource uh, developed in time for this uh, talk. However, uh, there will be arm waving, so be warned. Um, so oh, I'll start with the photo up there. So first is the shot of the boater prospect area. Um, you see it's a bit of prime agricultural land. Uh, there's a few wind towers growing on top of hills of known copper mineralisation. And uh, the photo was during our drill out, um, which is basically 100 metre by 50 metre uh, space drilling, just to give you some sense of perspective uh, disclaimer. So acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Alcane Discovery team as led by Rod Dean. Um, he unfortunately has COVID today. However, he has told me he's working on the resource, so it's not so bad. Um, Ian Chalmers is in the audience and he hates anything nice being said about him, um, so I'll try not to embarrass him too much. But um, he's been a determined supporter of the, uh, the project since the beginning and even when we didn't have much in the way of budgets, um, we always found a bit of, bit of, bit of money for Boda. And uh, Alan Wilson, um, he was brought in soon after the discovery and this geological uh, model is built on a lot of his work. And Tony Crawford, uh, who works with all our projects. Uh, Tony regularly tells me Alcane's in the top two um, of his clients. Tony also has a professor, uh, or is a professor of marketing. So uh, he's never revealed to me who this other client is. <laughs> all right, so today's talk will uh, provide a brief overview of Alcane. Um, then I'll go into the geological setting of Boda. Um, then I'll uh, talk about Boda's unique style of porphyry mineralisation. Now I'll attempt to summarise all this in a geological model and finish with the exploration implications for finding more of these things. So Alcane's been operating in the central west for over 30 years and in this time we developed and um, started the Peak Hill gold mine back when gold price was at $400 an ounce. Um, we did get a small profit from that and with that we uh, used to discover Tom Ingley. Um, Tom Ingley Camp is now over 2 million ounces and uh, will be operating for at least another 10 years, so uh, plenty of funding for Boda. Um, and Alcane's done some other good stuff. Um, we were in a joint venture with Newmont and we discovered the McPhillamy's uh, uh, deposit and we used that sale to help fund or commission the Tom Ingley Gold Plant and um, the processing of the Dubbo Rare Earth uh, deposit. Um, oh, in 2019 we uh, discovered Boda. So we've seen this a few times. Um, so yeah, the figure shows a major porphyry and epithermal deposits within the Ordovician Macquarie Arc. Um, as um, was put up previously by Anthony Harris, um, he, he spoke about the Lachlan transverse zone. I think he left off the Dubbo transverse zone, um, which is, we think is very important and um, it will be part of the, the story today. Um, and we hope to have that voter resource estimated for you guys uh, by the end of the month. So a bit of history. Um, we acquired uh, the EL uh, from Rio Tinto uh, back in 2004. Um, it was uh, initial work sort of focused on the Bedangra workings, um, which is the Mitchells Creek mine, uh, which we don't uh, have anymore. Um, it was, it's basically a high grade quartz vein which produced about 70,000 ounces, however we didn't uh, have much success there. So then we switched our focus to uh, porphyry style targets, um, including areas around the historic Kaiser mine. Uh, the Kaiser workings is the only significant workings you know, in the immediate uh, region of Boda and it had estimates of only 1,500 ounces of gold being pulled out and no recorded copper. Um, previous exploration uh, companies have estimated a non-jork uh, compliance uh, uh, deposit of 0 0.4 million tonnes of about one gram gold and a percent copper. So yeah, back to the Dubbo transverse zone. Um, so Boda, uh, well sorry, we, all those red blobs uh, for you, there's no key there. Um, they're the intrusive centres that we've mapped um, and they're usually associated with magnetic complexes. Uh, Boda's located at the intersection of arc parallel structures, such as probably subsidiary structures to the Nindapana thrust um, and the Dubbo transverse zone. And this creates um, a large space for uh, fluid flow um, and so it's, yeah, it's interesting where Boda sits. 
Um, and yeah, basically the, all that geology, that's all of our projects, um, and that's all been mapped as a Cheeseman Creek formation. So the Boda geology sequence is a large pile of lavas, seals and dikes. Uh, we're very in the little way of intercalated uh, sediments. So as shown on the Shoshinitic affinities plot, um, the volcanics are strongly Shoshinitic, separating them well away from the Calcalcalic volcanics. Uh, the Ganamala and Forest Reef volcanics using the same plot also illustrate their affinity with Boda. Um, so due to the lack of uh, sediments, identification of marker units is extremely difficult. So we use uh, lithogeochemistry, it's basically an essential tool for us, um, and that helps both mapping and classifying the vol volcanics. Um, it, is, it has defined two major suites. Uh, the first suite is a more primitive augite-ferric basalt, uh, which dominates the lower parts of the volcanic stratigraphy. Um, and the second suite is a more evolved hornblende ferric um, augite plagioclase as well, ferric uh, basalt again, site. Um, so, and it uh, apparently has apatite microfenicris as well, which are common. Uh, and its position in the upper part of the stratigraphy is more abundant and correlates with the phase uh, two upper bridge, fair bridge uh, volcanics. And this is due to their common hornblende finicris, uh, which are quite rare in the uh, Macquarie Arc. Um, and yeah, basically when we've plotted all these up, um, we start mapping the volcanic units. Um, they sort of give a general flat lying uh, dip or, or east dip. All right, so the intrusives, um, the main intrusives in the volcanic pile, in order from oldest to youngest, are the augite plagioclase Monzo Gabbro, uh, which is a feeder dike to the lavas. Um, this one shows a clear timing constraint with a pink Monza diorite cross-cutting it. Now the next one is a more evolved plagioclase hornblende Monza diorite porphyry with occasional apatite fenicris. Um, this example shows those dark circular things are hornblendite cognates which are likely to be ripped up from the um, magmatic system. Um, we see that also in the uh, Monza gabbros. And uh, we think both of these intrusives are presumed feeder dikes um, to the volcanic pile and are pre-mineral. Um, lastly, we have a biotite quartz monzonite, and these strike northwest. They can be up to sort of uh, 50 metres thick as dikes, uh, aphiric, and they host flat quartz uh, chalcopyrite veins um, that are gold poor. Um, so this sort of suggests that the dikes are late mineral. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of other late dikes. Uh, we've got you know, a couple of suites of alkaline dolerites um, that post-date the calc potassic alteration and are probably due to the opening of the hill and trough. And we also have the Willamon granite that uh, intrudes a couple of kilometres away from Boda and we get these sort of rhyolite dikes uh, often uh, intruding into the pile. So... <coughs> The Boda system is centred around a stock of magmatic hydrothermal breaches, uh, driving the extensive calcitacic alteration. So these pictures show a transition from depth of a magmatic intrusive breccia on the left, transitioning to a magmatic hydrothermal breccia, transitioning to a just a pure hydrothermal breccia. And this is where we get the uh, sulphide cemented breccias and, uh, and also where our best uh, gold copper grades occur at Boda. Uh, we've defined uh, up to five intrusive hydrothermal breaches, and these breaches are likely post the emplacement of those of the Monza diorites you saw on the previous slide. Um, and we think the intrusive breaches are the causative to the Boda system. Our petrology is to confirm that idea. So. Um, with the alteration and mineralisation at Boda, um, Alcane's drilled approximately 100,000 metres of, of uh, drilling. And, and um, we've defined three kilometres of continuous calcritacic alteration with gold copper mineralisation uh, from Boda 3 to Kaiser. Um, the alteration strikes north south from Boda 3 to uh, Boda and then it rotates at Boda and you know, trends northwest towards Kaiser. Um, this, um, and also note, yeah, that all the drilling for Boda, you can probably see it there, um, I don't know what to point out, um, 
it uh, occurs off the northwest flank of the magnetic complex. Um, so maybe the Bode mineralization alteration is destroying uh, an earlier magnetite potassic event. So the characteristic alteration is made up of biotite, actinolite, epidote, and magnetite. Um, there is extensive biotite, but a lack of case bar. This is due to the mafic country rock um, with a high availability of iron, calcium, and magnesium, and a low availability of silica. Uh, the margins of the potassic alteration, you can sometimes see a subtle reddening. Um, and this reddening is the result of hematite dusting of albite. Uh, this has comparisons to cadia and is also characteristic of the inner propylytic alteration zone, together with an increase of actinolite and epidote. Uh, we do get copper sulphides in the inner propylytic zone, and these are often uh, occurring with stockwork, calcite veinlets uh, that can be sub-economic to economic in grade. Um, as the uh, propylytic alteration becomes more distal, um, it has a typical uh, chlorite albite pyrite mineral assemblage. Um, the main phase of Boda is associated with uh, calcite sulphide stockwork veining and cross-cutting these, as shown on that bottom figure there, are uh, flat-lying sheeted uh, quartz, carbon, uh, quartz chalcopyrite veins that are gold poor. Um, this is a significant difference to the Cadia and North Parks deposits where their high grades are usually associated with vertical sheeted quartz uh, sulphide veins. And this, uh, this is a main section through the centre of our deposit um, and it shows the grades and core of the main chalcopyrite cemented breccia as uh, in hit by KSDD7 which uh, included uh, what we think is a world, world class intercept. <laughs> So, um, and now this section is through the northwesternmost uh, line of our drilling, uh, Boda, where we've recently defined a bornite chalcopyrite breccia. Um, this is the first breccia we've encountered that is zoned to a bornite rich core, and uh, it's pretty exciting, so we're sort of chasing that up. Um, overprinting the northeast shoulder of Boda is a blanket of philic alteration, and it can be up to 200 metres thick. It's copper leach, but gold rich. And a second such zone has been identified at Boda 2 and is also positioned on the eastern side of the uh, gold copper mineralisation. Uh, there is some evidence of epithermal um, mineralisation in the shallower levels, uh, as you can see from that crustiform photo, uh, vein texture photo I put on there. Uh, we also did some pyrite laser ablation mapping uh, with an arc linkage program that suggested there, there could be an epithermal uh, nature to, to the pyrite. So the Boda system overall has a chalcopyrite rich mineralisation centre around a core of intrusive hydrothermal breaches. Um, that zones outwards to being more pyrite dominant and copper poor. It also exhibits the zonation of metals within the hydrothermal breaches uh, themselves. Yeah, so basically what I'm trying to show here on the photos is um, you've got a pyrite rich uh, hydrothermal breccia zoned into a chalcopyrite rich hydrothermal breccia with um, a bit of visible gold um, and then down into where you're starting to get bornite fracturing within the um, chalcopyrite um, breccia with visible gold. Um, and all the class you can see are heavily potassium altered, they're just biotite replaced volcanics. So this is some earlier work by Alan Wilson um, on Boda, and he's showing that Boda exhibits classic porphyry metal zonation. Uh, there's two significant philic pyrite zones as defined by the anomalous arsenic, tellurium and bismuth, and these are bounding uh, the northeast of Boda and the southeast of Boda or Boda II. Um, and they're also indicators of shallow mineralisation. Uh, the more distal zones of anomalous lead zinc have been mapped, and these bound the core of copper gold and the Boda copper gold zone remains open to the northwest um, and where we have hit some significant, uh, recently we hit some significant mineralisation at Corridor um, and also I think the zonation pattern sort of indicates possibly that the system plunges to the northwest as well if you uh, believe the way that pyrite's mapped, the Felix one. All right, so to summarise all this into a cartoon, um, we've got a lava-dominated stratigraphy with a more primitive sequence of uh, volcanics at the base, overlain by a suite of more evolved uh, basaltic andesites with hornblende vinicris. 
The, um, the larva sequence, um, uh, the dominant larva sequence, uh, suggests that Boda is positioned beneath a major submarine stratovolcano, um, where you've got the sediments being transported away into uh, surrounding basinal settings. Uh, the alteration of the host rocks is extensive calc potassic uh, copper gold mineralisation centred around intrusive breccias, and these zone out to inner and outer propylitic alteration and overprinted by a significant gold rich fillet blanket. It's a unique style of uh, uh, porphyry mineralisation to the Macquarie Arc uh, with intrusive hydrothermal breccias hosted in lavas. This is unlike the breccia mineralisation at the 230 deposit at North Parks and the Cadia Quarry uh, deposit that are hosted in earlier monzonite intrusions. Uh, the boda uh, might be more similar in nature to some of the uh, calic deposits in uh, British Columbia where there is uh, more silica undersaturated uh, mineralisation in contrast uh, to what you see at Cadia and North Parks. And uh, yeah, the lithogeochem chem clearly uh, places boda in the late Ordovician to early Silurian Shoshinitic volcanic intrusive uh, event of the Molong volcanic belt. So what we've learnt and what we did, um, so the early exploration recognised the importance of the magnetic complexes, uh, which being related to potassic magnetite alteration, usually associated with intrusives. And as such, uh, five such complexes were mapped. Four of these complexes were positioned within the northwest uh, magnetic liniments defined as the Dubbo transverse zone. Uh, these being uh, Finns crossing, uh, which includes a stratigraphic parallel magnetic feature, um, which we think might be a buried scarn. There is some encouraging mineralites float around the place. Uh, the Drill Creek intrusive complex, um, it's a magnetic feature that uh, parallels the uh, DTZ, so that's pretty interesting. And there's also a nearby uh, extensive uh, phyllic alteration uh, that we have drilled, uh, but yeah, had very little in the way of gold, unfortunately. Um, but you know, maybe too high up or something. And uh, the Kaiser intrusive complex, um, and this has extensive low grade gold copper mineralisation defined at the Duke zone and is uh, associated with, uh, that is associated with the magnetic complex, but it's the more high grading stuff that occurs off the flanks of that, of that mag feature. And then of course the Boda intrusive complex um, which is in a way similar to Kaiser in that the more magnetic stuff only seems to host lower grade gold copper mineralisation. However, it's off the, the flanks of these features that we're, uh, we're seeing uh, better grades. So IP is another big, big one for us. Um, there's been seven programs completed over the tenement, um, including three historic surveys by Rio. Uh, IP conducted by Rio in 1999 highlighted the uh, gold copper mineralisation at Kaiser as well as those two phyllic zones at Boda and Boda II. Uh, Alcane conducted a survey over the Boda stratigraphy following the discovery but unfortunately those wind farms were there and uh, yeah we don't use that uh, survey much. And, um, in and then just recently, uh, as of the last few months, uh, we completed an IP survey over the Drill Creek intrusive complex. So we're pretty interested in that because as it's in the northwest corridor there. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of compelling sort of chargeability anomalies there that will be followed up. So I'd just like to finish with the discovery section of Boda. Uh, like most discoveries, they, they involve uh, numerous companies and uh, an aggressive ex exploration attitude and perseverance and a bit of luck. Um, so Rio originally drilled the Boda area in 95 um, with shallow RC and they outlined a zone, a small zone of uh, low grade mineralisation of about 600 by 200 metres. Um, they then followed this up with a small IP survey and then uh, passed the project to Alcane. So then in 2016, uh, Alcane targeted Boda with a deep RC hole into a coincident IP feature uh, that was on the flank of the Boda magnetic complex. And this intersected 300 metres of about 0.3 gram material, of, uh, but most of that was phyllic alteration. However, towards the bottom of that hole, we did uh, intercept uh, roughly 24, 25 metres of uh, strong potassic alteration with our uh, gold copper grades. Uh, so in 2019, we followed this up with a diamond hole that intersected over 500 metres of significant gold copper mineralisation 
They included both the philic blanket and the uh, potassic uh, alteration, and thus confirming it as a significant porphyry system in the Macquarie Arc. So uh, to finish up, um, exploration has identified Boda as a gold, copper, alkalic porphyry system associated with intrusive hydrothermal breaches of a host sequence of basaltic andesite lavas. Uh, Boda represents a unique style of significant porphyry mineralisation for the Macquarie Arc. Exploration work will be continuing at Boda 2, Kaiser, Corridor and Drill Creek, as well as some more distal SCARN targets such as Finns Crossing. And the Boda Maiden resource is due for release later this month and uh, yeah, we'll confirm Boda as a state significant greenfields discovery for New South Wales. Thank you.